Ask Talk of the Day, we have Kostas Saskalakas who will tell us about learning with a few samples. All right, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thank you everybody for being here. So uh, this is joint work with my amazing students, uh, Yuval Dagan, uh, Nisanti Karla, and uh, Vardis Kandiras. And uh, before I jump into uh, the Ising model itself, I'd like to spend a little bit talking about the broader uh, research perspective. Um, and this is motivated by uh, the common uh, uh, operating regime that uh, we prove learning results for, which is that uh, in which we have uh, uh, access to multiple independent samples from some uh, distribution of interest. Um, so very commonly, uh, independent observations, uh, uh, especially of complex phenomena, are uh, unavailable or very expensive to obtain because uh, uh, commonly we're interested in uh, phenomena that uh, have a spatial component or a temporal component or they're co collected on a social network. And as such, it, it, in these types of scenarios, it's hard to get uh, independent observations, right? So um, there are many cases where uh, uh, phenomena we try to study either in nature or in uh, 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 social uh, environments uh, are involve uh, observations that are scattered in time or in space or on a network. And, and this has been studied a lot in various fields. Um, and, and here are some reference from the uh, uh, social sciences studying all sorts of different uh, human behaviors over uh, social networks. So in that, this type of setting, um, um, when we collect data, we encounter problems of the following type, okay? So, um, so suppose I have a lot of observations uh, on students uh, in some college, and each observation comprises a feature vector, xi, and some label, yi, which could be either binary or, or scalar or, or, you know, ternary or whatever. Uh, for example, um, uh, Xi could be uh, the feature vector of some student, and uh, Yi could be whether they drink alcohol or not, or how much alcohol they're uh, drinking per week. So in this type of setting, the question is the following. So are these observations uh, N samples from some distribution, or are they one big sample? from some high dimensional distribution with dependencies. So I would argue that uh, it is the latter. So for example, if the behaviors of the students are binary, I would think that uh, the vector of all the binary behaviors of all the students is some uh, could be some distribution that looks like uh, what I'm writing here, which, which has uh, some, whose density has some component that depends on the individual fe features of, of, of different students, but also some component that entangles the behaviors of, uh, of different students according to some uh, uh, interaction matrix uh, by which they are connected and determined by how strong uh, uh, the peer effects are in this setting. So, so this is sort of like a little example to illustrate settings where um, it's uh, more uh, um, appropriate to think of uh, what we, the data we have as dependent observations and not independent observations of some phenomenon. And, and the type of uh, question you would like to ask in these types of settings is, uh, is it possible to to prove pack learning results, like we have been doing for independent samples in this type of setting? Or is it possible to do parameter estimation in, in this type of setting? And more broadly, what, if anything, can we learn for a high dimensional distribution given a single sample from that distribution? So, so this is the broader um, 
uh, 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 area that uh, uh, is motivating uh, today's talk. And for some work uh, in this broader area uh, that we have done, uh, you can check uh, papers by uh, you know different subsets of the authors of, of, of this paper. But uh, without further ado, let me jump into the main topic of uh, today's talk, which is the Ising model. Hey, so, before you do that, can I ask, you know, yeah, you, you could view those examples like in an online setting and you can still get rid of the IID assumption and you could just hope to prove regret bounds. Um, how, how, I mean, that, that also would get rid of the dependence. I mean, handle the IID issue. That's a, that's a great question. That's a great comment, Adam. And indeed, uh, sort of like if the data has a temporal component, this very well fits in the online learning uh, 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 viewpoints. And indeed, uh, uh, some of the interesting works that have been done uh, uh, in this uh, uh, topic uh, by Mori and others look at, uh, uh, yeah, a, a sort of like temporal data uh, trying to prove uh, uh, generalization bounds. Uh, so for a social network, you know, you would be looking for a way to um, uh, traverse maybe the network in a way that uh, decorrelates uh, uh, things. Uh, this has been done by London et al. Uh, but, but, but yeah, uh, you know, the punchline is that we're missing a lot of technology to understand these types of settings. Okay. Uh, cool. So, yeah, I mean, so this is very fertile and, uh, uh, you know, a, a call to arms is to develop the right tools to address this type of, of, of setting. Uh, so, Jumping into the Ising model, uh, I hope you've all seen it. This is a classical model from uh, statistical physics, uh, which uh, samples a, a vector uh, over the Boolean hypercube according to a log density uh, that is basically a quadratic form. So maybe the simplest way to, to look at it is what's written here. So the log density is just a quadratic form where J is an interaction matrix, it's N by N, and H is a vector of, a, of what, are, what are called external fields. So Z is whatever you need so that this is a density. Um, yeah, so uh, basically what's happening here is that uh, it's uh, uh, coordinate is plus or minus one. Uh, the sign and magnitude of this J i J uh, is the local encouragement uh, of Xi and Xj to have different or opposite signs depending on the magnitude and sign of Jij. And also there is an external field on every uh, coordinate that also is pushing it one way or another. But uh, these local encouragements can be over overwritten uh, by implicit, uh, uh, by, by paths uh, through the uh, underlying network in the support of J. So it's a complex uh, uh, distribution to reason about. Uh, so it has been proposed as a simple model to study phase transitions uh, in spin glasses, but uh, uh, it's a very natural form uh, and flexibility has uh, given it many applications uh, in statistical physics, computer vision, social network science, uh, game theory, computational biology, and many other fields. And it's also, you know, trying to understand its mathematical properties have been a topic of study uh, in, in many fields, inclu including all these fields that I just mentioned, but also theoretical computer science, probability theory, and machine learning. So uh, today's topic is learning Ising models from samples. So the learning problem we will be interested in is the following. We're given L samples, L independent samples uh, from an Ising model with some underlying interaction matrix and external fields. Maybe we know some constraints, uh, we have some constraints on these. And our goal is to estimate these parameters. Um, so what, what types of constraints would you impose on, on, on these parameters for, for the problem to be uh, on the tractable side? A standard assumption um, is that uh, uh, the temperature, um, which relates to the infinity norm of this interaction matrix, uh, isn't too low. So, so the, this, this 
thing here is basically the inverse temperature of the model. So we need an upper bound on the inverse temperature. Uh, that's a standard assumption that has been made in uh, recent work in TCS for learning Ising models. And it's a substantive, it's an important assumption. Uh, if uh, um, you place no assumptions uh, uh, on the model, then uh, it, it could be that it's impossible to meaningfully learn it. But let's leave that for, for a different discussion. Um, the non-substantive assumption that I will make uh, today is that uh, there is no external field. So um, uh, what's in particular uh, implies that uh, distribution is, is symmetric. So if you flip uh, 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 the probability of X, if you flip uh, all the signs, uh, it stays identical. Um, so it will make today's presentation easier, but uh, what I'm about to describe extends to when you add uh, uh, external fields, as long as you bound, bound them similarly to bounding the interaction matrices. All right, so with these assumptions, so here's the learning task that I'm interested in. So L samples from an Isaac model. Now I'm simplifying my notation because the external field is gone. Uh, the interaction matrix has this uh, uh, bound on the temperature. And I may potentially add, throw in some other uh, constraints and um, uh, I'm going to abstract away these constraints by J belonging to some family of interaction matrices. Uh, so my goal today will be to estimate, given these samples, to estimate the interaction matrix to minimize the Frobenius norm of the network. Other, uh, other types of guarantees uh, are also reasonable, but I'm going to uh, focus on this one today. So what do we know about this learning problem? As I've mentioned, there has been a renaissance, there has been a long line of research on this topic uh, in uh, uh, machine learning and other fields, but uh, there has also been a renaissance of algorithms in uh, TCS uh, uh, starting this uh, uh, problem and even more general problems. And uh, uh, this focus on uh, the case where L is polynomial in the size of the network. There's also a separate uh, strand of work in probability theory that targets, that targets single sample uh, estimation of the Isaac model where L equals one. Of course, uh, it's gonna be very difficult to learn a general Isaac model when L equals one. So uh, these papers put some assumptions on uh, uh, the interact some extra assumptions on the interaction matrix. So let me discuss what these people do. So the multiple sample literature uh, 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 places uh, no more assumptions than uh, that the uh, infinity norm is bounded by M. And in this case, they bound the Frobenius norm by some single exponential function of M, root N, the size of the network, and log n over the number of samples that you have to some uh, to, to one fourth. And in particular, uh, this uh, type of bound becomes interesting as soon as L is bigger than log n, the, the log the number of uh, variables uh, in the network, as, you know, as long as you pay this exponential constant in the beginning. Uh, and the reason is that um, the, with, with the assumption that I've made, the Frobenius norm is bounded by root n, so uh, uh, the moment L becomes uh, comparable to log N, you start uh, uh, shaving off uh, multiples of root N. So, th so this, this type of bound becomes interesting. Uh, as I've said, in the single sample case, we need to make more assumptions to prove something meaningful. And uh, this line of work I'm starting here has considered this very, very, very special case of the problem, which is uh, again, I'm placing an upper bound on the inverse temperature. And uh, also, this is a strong assumption, assuming that uh, uh, the matrix, the interaction matrix is known up to a scalar, uh, up to an unknown scalar factor. Or it's also placed some, some extra assumptions 
about uh, the well-behavedness of the log partition function uh, around the matrix uh, of the model. And under those assumptions, they show that given a single sample, they can estimate the interaction matrix to within one over this uh, root of the log partition function of the model. So this is just a comment. Just yeah. comment that, you know, if, you, if you're interested in just the infinity norm rather than the Frobenius norm, then of course we don't need that square root of n factor up there on the approximation. I'm not sure why you're interested in the Frobenius norm here instead of just infinity norm, but. Uh, yeah, so uh, that, that's right. So the, the way, yeah, so the way we get uh, this result from your result <laughs> is to exactly use the infinity bound and uh, multiply by root n to get the Frobenius bound. Uh, I'm interested in the Frobenius bound because uh, uh, in, in, in the setting that I, I will be working with, it's going to be hard to get uh, infinity bound guarantees. Okay, thanks. So the goal of this work, and also sort of like, you know, I'm looking to unify these two lines of work. So the, our goal is to, um, to unify these two separate strands of the literature and interpolate uh, between them for different, for varying values of L uh, and different settings of this Cal graphic J. And we also get, want to get richer results. So let's see what we can do. So, all right, so uh, the single, so our single result, uh, this is the main result, everything else is a corollary, is the following. So it operates in this setting where we're given a single sample from the Isaac model with some unknown J. We place this bound on J and uh, uh, we uh, assume some family from which this J is coming from. Um, so in this setting, uh, given a single sample, what we can show is that, so, so I'll unpack this statement, it looks big, but I'll unpack it. Uh, given a single sample, there is an estimator j hat, uh, it's a function of this single sample that we got, uh, so that with a probability at least one minus delta with respect to the choice, the, 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 the sampling of this x from the true model, uh, the, esti the estimation error is bounded by that uh, single exponential that's unavoidable, root some stuff. So this stuff is log log, the, si the size of the network, log one over delta, the probability of error. And so this is the important thing. So this is log of um, uh, the covering number of this family of matrices uh, in radius one over n with respect to the operator norm, which is what I'm writing here. Moreover, uh, our estimator uh, is uh, the minimum uh, over this family J, Cal J, of uh, uh, a convex function. So in particular, it can be efficiently computed using gradient descent if this set is a convex set and you can project on it. So this is the main result. And from this main result, the only thing I'm gonna keep from now on is uh, this part. So I have dropped this exponential singlet exponential dependence on them, which is standard in this line of work. I've also dropped the log one over delta and the log log n. So I've kept only this bare uh, uh, statement and I wanna see some uh, corollaries of this statement. So the first corollary is when J, the uh, candidate uh, networks is a finite class. In this case, uh, the bound is a log the size of the class. Because the covering number trivially, you can choose everything in the class so you get just the cardinality of the class. Corollary number two 
is the case uh, where you have a linear class. So suppose that uh, the unknown matrix is a linear combination of K non matrices. In this case, by plugging into this bound, you can get that the error is root k log n. Again, I'm reminding you that under my assumptions, j, the Frobenius norm of j is root up is could be m root n. So this is a meaningful result. It's a non-trivial result. So uh, um, if, if you know. Uh, um, yeah, so it's uh, uh, k root k log n uh, when the maximum of this is m root n. Uh, a third color corollary, sparse linear class. So suppose so I'm in the same setting like this, but now uh, it's a sparse linear combination of k known matrices. So, so now what do you expect? S log so K. By inter <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's, uh, exactly. So it's S root, uh, root S, the sparsity, log N, N K. Uh, okay, so fourth corollary. I mean, I, these are just some corollaries that, that we wrote down here. Uh, fourth corollary, manifold. So suppose that uh, J, the possible interaction matrices are the range uh, as you vary uh, some K dimensional beta uh, through some Lipschitz function that maps uh, this K dimensional space to R and N, the space of matrices. Then uh, the error you get is K log N times the Lipschitzness. So there are some immediate corollaries from the main theorem. Right again, I'm given a single sample from this model. Uh, and I want to understand what type of error I can attain uh, estimating the interaction matrix um, given this single sample and uh, something about the candidate, the, the possible uh, interaction matrices that this uh, model is coming from. What happens if you know that the graph is a tree or something like that? Do you get anything non-trivial then? Um, we didn't really study the tree, to be honest. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Yeah, uh, we, we did, yeah, we, we haven't really studied the tree. I mean, in this uh, in this paper, uh, as you know, Eric Price is going to talk about a paper on the Chai Liu algorithm on Wednesday, where um, the distribution is learned without any bounds on M. We also have a parallel line of work doing that, but uh, this is not from a single sample. So I haven't really thought about trees. Okay. Uh, so speaking of uh, L samples or multiple samples, let's go back to this problem, the more classical problem where you have L samples from an Ising model and you want to estimate the uh, matrix J hat. Um, well, I claim that the uh, tool that I gave you can already handle this case. And the reason is that uh, L samples from uh, any Ising model can be viewed as uh, one sample uh, uh, from a tensorized uh, uh, Ising model with the same, uh, uh, with, with who's uh, basically L disjoint copies of this model. So L samples from this model is uh, one sample from just L copies of that same model. And because I have a result for learning from one sample, I can just apply this uh, result to see what it gives me for L samples. So let's see what it does give me, what it gives me. 
So here's how it, the result changes. If I if I if I just take our main result and apply it uh, by doing this silly uh, silly thing, okay, of 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 calling L samples, one sample from a bigger model. So what you get here is uh, something similar, right? So uh, there is an estimator J hat that now takes as input L samples, and uh, uh, with probability one minus delta with respect to those samples satisfies this bound uh, uh, for, 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 for Frobenius uh, uh, learning of, of J. So the, the standard exponential in M, this log one over delta log log N that I also had before. But the important thing is that now you get a boost. So your denominator, you get by L, the number of samples that you got at the, small expense, and I'll say why this is small, at the small expense that now the covering number that you're looking for is not uh, with radius one over n, but with radius one over n times L. So you, you're looking at a tighter cover now of the space of matrices. Uh, but uh, now you divide the error by root L. Now the reason this is good is that typically the impact of this factor of L here is logarithmic in L, while this is a root L, one over root L. So this is, you know, you're gaining by doing this. And the same qualifications apply as before. Again, this is the covering number with this radius of the interaction matrices under this norm. Uh, this is efficiently computable. It's the minimum of a convex function. Uh, over uh, this would be n times n times l, uh, so it's efficiently computable. If uh, uh, this set is a, I'm sorry, it is sorry, it is over this. Set. This is over the variable is interaction matrices. I'm sorry, so it is over r and n, and it's efficiently computable if this set is convex and you can project on it efficiently. Uh, are there any, there are some questions? Um, uh, Kostas, there's one question. Are there yeah. similar one sample results for structure learning? Uh, you mean learning the interact, like learning the support of J? Uh, I don't know, but I guess that, that is, yeah. Yeah, so learning the support of J, it's gonna be difficult to do unless you put lower bounds on the strengths of the edges. Like, so all previous work from uh, uh, multiple samples has been putting lower, like to, to recover the structure, they have been putting lower bounds on the strengths of each individual edge. And then uh, to satisfy this upper bound, then putting a bound on the degree of every node. So if you, and basically they recover the structure by proving stuff like this. So you can you can do this this thing you can you can convert these types of bounds maybe for news or with infinity norm into a structure uh, uh, results uh, yeah so this this is how these are typically obtained and but we haven't done this calculation but you can try to do this calculation and see what you get um, all right so again. Let's see some corollaries of this thing. Uh, and again, I kept uh, the, I dropped this exponential dependence in M. I dropped the log one over delta log log N. So let's go to consider that, is, you, know, you know, what happens if I place no constraint at all on, on, on J. So J is unconstrained. Then what you get is a Frobenius bound that's n squared log an L over L. So let's compare that to the uh, Clivens Mecca result. So the Clivens Mecca result was root n, a fourth root log n over L. So um, what what is the what is the fair comparison between these two results? So this result here. Uh, kicks in with a non-trivial bound already when L is, you know, comparable, like crosses log N. So this result, for it to give non-trivial bound, you need L to be above N. So this, so in that sense, so 
for small labs, this is uh, stronger, right? So an interesting guarantee uh, is uh, obtained when L is log N versus, but here when L is like N. The eventual rate of this is faster than this. Uh, so this is uh, fourth, I don't know, one, one to the fourth, this is one half. At the same time, I don't think the intention of these authors was to get, uh, I believe that their intention was to, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> their intention was to study the regime close to log n and, and you know, they were doing, uh, they, were, they were using sparse recovery type of results and this is uh, how they arrived over here. Uh, for this bound, we didn't really try, it just follows directly as a corollary of uh, our single sample result really. Uh, and we have not tried to add regularizers for every neighborhood uh, to, to arrive at sparse uh, type of guarantees. We didn't try it. Uh, we didn't try analyzing uh, our, uh, you know, what I'm going to show in a little bit uh, be our method with uh, regularization. So that's, that explains sort of like why uh, these results kick in faster than our results and why the eventual rate that we get here is faster than that rate. Uh, but that being said, the point of, of, of this slide is that, you know, without any effort from a single sample result, you immediately get some non-trivial guarantees for the general case of learning Ising models from multiple samples. Uh, moreover, uh, you don't need really need to assume independent samples. So you can get uh, such uh, similar rates, uh, even if you don't have L independent samples, but you have L dependent samples. So uh, in the paper, for example, we give one example where you have sort of like uh, an interspatial as well as intertemporal uh, uh, dependencies between samples. So you get uh, kind of like uh, different slices. So every slice is an Ising model, but all these slices are temporally uh, also dependent. So and uh, you can you can still arrive at such. Uh, 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 types of guarantees. So the point, the point of the thing is that this is a, a thinking of the problem as a single sample problem is a very flexible type of thing that can accommodate a single sample, multiple independent samples or multiple dependent samples. And I think there is a lot of uh, room here to, uh, you know, uh, prove, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, such guarantees for Markov random fields and other types of settings. So just in summary, and before I kind of like give a hint of the proof idea, this is, these are our results. So uh, uh, the columns are, uh, you know, what we assume about the family of interaction matrices and whether we have one sample or L samples for some arbitrary L. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, this summarizes sort of like the various classes that I considered, uh, finite class, linear combination of non matrices, sparse linear combination. Uh, I didn't add the uh, uh, manifold result here uh, and all matrices. Uh, um, also something that I didn't discuss is that, uh, um, uh, and that is in comparison to the Chatterjee result uh, and the, Pat the Patacharya Mukherjee result that I cited earlier. Uh, in the case where you have, uh, a, 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 if you know the interaction matrix up to a constant factor, uh, our guarantees are stronger than those that existed in the literature before. So we are able to remove certain uh, conditions uh, 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 that require the log partition function to be well behaved in the neighborhood of the true model. So, um, um, yeah, so this is basically a summary of our results. I should also say that we have a lower bound for general uh, interaction matrices. So we have a, essentially a, a lower bound that essentially that, you know, that is uh, close to matching, but not exactly of our, of our general upper bound. But, but if you apply our lower bound to finite classes and linear combinations, you get that our upper bounds are tied for these two cases. So our lower bound is for general classes is reasonably tight, uh, albeit not exactly tight. So this is basically the summary of the results. And unless there are questions, I would like to give a little overview of the techniques.
Okay, so the, but you know, sort of like, yeah, the, the, um, the, um, the high level idea here is that uh, considering the problem as a single sample learning problem is very flexible and it can apply to different cases where you have dependent samples or, you know, spatial temporarily dependent samples or even independent samples. Although that's not the focus of this broader line of work. All right, so proof ideas. Uh, all right, so the, 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 the first important idea is the following that, uh, so this model here is an exponential family, uh, which, you know, uh, has some good things, but, but also, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, well, some nice properties, but uh, in our single sample uh, case, uh, it's not clear how to use them anyways, but, uh, a natural idea in, in any event to learn, uh, given a single sample, to learn the interaction matrix is to try and uh, uh, maximize the likelihood of the sample. Unfortunately, that computation involves the partition function, this denominator here, which is in general intractable to compute. So we did not pursue in this work this approach. Costa, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So for the families of, of easy models that you're considering, like is uh, the computation of the partition function intractable? For example, for the high temperature regime, it can be done, right? Correct. Yeah. So uh, it is not, uh, yeah. So uh, this is not high temperature is the problem. So this is, uh, M is arbitrary. So we don't know that it is, yeah. So it's not, uh, so, uh, it is known to be intractable for the models that we try by a result by Sly and Sun. I see, I see, thanks. Yeah, so, and the problem is it's not, yeah, so it's uh, low, like, you know, there is a, yeah. Um, so, uh, what we propose to do is to maximize what is called the pseudo likelihood, which was, uh, which is a function uh, that was originally proposed by Bessag, but has been used from then in various places. So the pseudo likelihood is the product of the conditional uh, probabilities of the uh, individual uh, coordinates in the big sample. And the, the good thing about this product, which does not correspond to any, you know, I mean, reasonable uh, um, um, uh, quantity with respect to this measure, but it's just the product of the marginals or the conditionals. Uh, uh, it has an explicit form, so it does not involve the partition function. Uh, and moreover, uh, it, is, it results in a convex problem. So um, what Bessag proposed is to uh, maximize this function uh, in the feasible set, which is this. And as it turns out, uh, uh, the minus log of this thing is convex with respect to J. So you can optimize it uh, if this family is reasonable. If you can project on J, uh, you can optimize this function efficiently. Uh, but the pertinent question is, is it consistent? Is it gonna give you the right thing? So what Chatterjee and uh, then Bhattacharya and Mukherjee uh, showed is that the answer is yes. Uh, when uh, you know the matrix up to a constant factor and some extra properties that are all, all already mentioned about the well-behavedness of the partition function uh, hold. But we're interested in the general case. So what can we say then? So that's the main question. So here again, I'm reminding you all the notation that I'm using. So phi of J and a single sample is the minus log of the pseudo likelihood. And this is a convex function. Uh, this is the learning problem that I'm trying to solve. And uh, so the likelihood is this function here. So here's the high level plan of what we would like to do. Um, so suppose J star is the true model that is giving us the sample. And suppose J prime is some old far away truth in Frobenius norm. What I want to argue is that when I minimize the minus log to the likelihood, I'm not going to get this J prime. 
But I want to I want to argue that the j that I'm going to get by optimizing this function is something close to j star. So it better be that you know if j prime is far from j star and from minus, uh, I'm not going to get it when I optimize the minus log pseudo likelihood. So what I want to show is that with high probability with respect to the randomness of x from j star, that uh, uh, phi value on J prime, which is far away from J star, is bigger, bigger than uh, uh, the phi value on J star itself, which in particular would imply that J hat cannot be J prime because J hat must be at least as good as J star. Maybe J star is not the optimum, but J, J hat should be at least as good as that. And if that already beats this other candidate, then J hat cannot be that other guy J prime. That, that is the plan. Okay, so quantitatively, here's what we show. That for some pair of constants, if J star is the true model and J hat is some other candidate, then with some good probability, one minus something that depends on the distance of the two models, the minus log pseudo likelihood on J prime is bigger than uh, at J star by at least the Frobenius norm squared between the two models. So this is what we show. Um, and uh, of course, the way I've stated it, this guarantee holds for a fixed J prime, but I want for all J primes. But, but going from this bound to for all, to get a uniform bound that for all J primes that are far, uh, this is going to hold. You, there is just where you use covers. Okay, so that's not the, that's not you know going from a fixed J prime to all J primes that are far is not the core of the argument. The core of the argument is proving that for a fixed J prime that is far from the truth, this is going to hold with high probability. Now, the main technical challenge is doing that is that the function whose values we're interested in is not just a function of j, but it's also a function of x. So what is x? x is a single sample from this Ising model. This Ising model is not in high temperature. So this Ising model is in lowish, like you know, the temperature is lower bounded but by m. Uh, so it's not, doesn't satisfy the Bruchin's condition. So we, we have to analyze the properties of a function of x in the lowish temperature regime. And that is difficult because uh, we don't know how to prove concentration, not the concentration of functions of dependent random variables. Um, so pictorially, the minus log pseudo likelihood is a nice convex function. Its optimum is where the greater, like the, the minimum of this. Okay, so the problem is constrained, but okay, for picture, let's say that the minimum is where it's zero. The true model is not necessarily the minimizer of this function. So the true model could be something where else. Now, what I want to argue is that some J prime that is far from the truth is certainly not going to be J hat, the minimum. And the way I want to do that is to look at properties of this function. And here's what we do. We study this function in the segment that connects the truth and this alternative model. So this is the segment here. At equals zero is J star. At equals one is J prime, this other candidate. And uh, by... Um, Taylor's theorem or whatever, intermediate value theorem, the value of this function, I'm dropping x for now, the value of j prime of this fun is the value of j star. Uh, uh, the uh, derivative with respect to t at uh, here with respect to t. Idiot. Uh, and half of the second derivative at some uh, time, psi. So what we show, given this uh, exact equality, what we show is two things. 
that the second derivative is more than four times the absolute of the first derivative in the whole interval here. And also, so in particular, even if this is negative, it does not, is not bigger than the positive. This is a, this is must be positive because the function is convex, but the question is, you know, like, is the positivity of this guy bigger than the possible negativity of that guy? So what we show is that in the whole interval, uh, this is, you know, it dominates the possible negative of this guy. And also this guy is bigger than the error that the, than the, the, than the lower bound that we wanted to prove. So putting the two together, we get that uh, uh, certainly this holds. Now, okay, so that's, that's, that's a good intention. But again, as I was saying earlier, the technical difficulties here are that these two derivatives that we're interested in are functions of x, which is a vector of dependent on the variables. Moreover, as it turns out, we cannot find a function that depends only on the two, these two endpoints, j star and j prime, that is sandwiched between the second derivative and the absolute value of the first derivative. It's actually, uh, and that's sort of like, it was a stumbling block in a, you know, the previous line of work. As it turns out, we have to identify a data dependent quantity that we can sandwich between the two derivatives. So you cannot find an absolute lower bound on the curvature that is, is bigger also than the uh, 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 gradient. You have to find a data dependent lower bound on the curvature that is bigger than the absolute value of the gradient. Uh, so this is what we want to do. And um, uh, so the way we do that is that to prove this uh, guy, the, the, the red one, we argue that the difference of this from that concentrates around zero. To argue the purple one, we argue that the difference of this from that is positive with high probability. And, and that is where concentration and anti-concentration of measure for functions of X, which are a vector of dependent on the variable will come into play. So at the end of the day, we have to prove uh, um, anti-concentration of measure results, new anti-concentration of measure results for functions of uh, the IZ model in this regime, which is low-ish temperature. And also, you know, prove a general uh, uh, concentration inequality uh, under high temperature. And we have a way to use this concentration inequality to also imply the, the right concentration that we want for the uh, low temperature regime that we're interested in. So this was kind of like an impressionistic view of the uh, proof, but again, the punchline is that uh, after you frame it as a, um, a single dimensional uh, comp uh, bounding that involves uh, derivatives and second derivatives of the uh, log pseudo likelihood, uh, uh, the, 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 the real challenge is that bounding these quantities uh, cannot be done, first of all, uniformly, but you have to have a data dependent bound. And, and still, uh, arguing these inequalities involves concentration on the concentration of measure, which you, you know, does not exist and we have to, to, to invent it. So this is basically what I, what I have to say uh, in conclusion. Again, samples from high dimensional distributions can be scarce or expensive to acquire. And this motivates this broader line of work of learning and statistical estimation from a single sample. What we do in this work is we provide such an algorithm for estimating the interaction matrix of the Ising model from a single sample. Uh, and we quantify the error with respect to the metric entropy of possible interaction matrices in some family. So this way we unify, extend and interpolate between two separate lines of work uh, dealing with multiple sample estimation or single sample estimation. We can do anything in the middle and also get uh, stronger results in some of these interpolate regimes. Um, 
and and you know on the deeper and mathematical side you know you know getting leverage here requires you to prove concentration anti concentration of measure now, thank you very much thank you for this uh, <clears throat> are there any questions uh, i have a question oh okay there are questions sorry uh, Anna was asking, is there, is there a way to get intuition about pseudo likelihood? Like, is there a natural optimization yeah. algorithm which optimizes this objective? So, the, the natural algorithm, I mean, uh, yeah, so as I said, you can do gradient descent. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't really <laughs> started, you know, like try to interpret what, uh, uh, what it does. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, so it would be interesting to kind of like look at the iteration and see if that, you know, what they mean. Uh, but uh, sort of like intuition about uh, the functional form itself, uh, you can uh, derive. So it's not sort of like a, it's not a horrible idea to do uh, uh, pseudo likelihood. And the rationale for that is this, that, you know, remember how, uh, uh, you know, so, so let's consider a very sparse grid like the grid. Uh, and suppose you are able to find an, a, a large independent set of uh, your graph. Uh, then writing the likelihood of the nodes in the independent set is going to be part of that product of the, of the, of the, uh, of the pseudo likelihood. So, so the conditioning on everybody else the independent set is now conditionally independent. Uh, so uh, the likelihood of the nodes participating in the independent set conditioning on the nodes in the complement of the independent set, um, that, that the likelihood is a, is a product measure. Uh, and it's part of what goes into the pseudo likelihood. Now, in the types of settings that I'm interested in, I don't have a sparse graph. The independent set is not going to be necessarily large. So uh, the leap of faith is that because of the assumption on the, the you know the lower bound of the temperature, uh, it's not a horrible idea to write down that product of conditionals. And, and sort of like the analysis that we do implies that this is the case. Of course, as my picture was saying, uh, we're not claiming that the minimum of that thing is the true model, but we can argue that the true model isn't too far from the minimum. Uh, I have another question actually. So uh, this is slightly different from what you were discussing, but um, is it an interesting question to say ask uh, some property about J, like you don't want to actually infer what J is, but something like, is J homogeneous? Is it basically all the interaction parameters are the same or is it very far from such a matrix? Woods, yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that would certainly be interesting. Um, uh, so, so I guess, you know, like, I guess your question applies to either one sample from the model or multiple samples from the model. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking like, you know, doing something faster than learning. Like uh, you just want to know some property of this easing model, like the underlying interaction parameters, not actually learning the parameters per se. Yeah. So, so this has, has been pursued, although not as much. So we have a paper with, uh, Nissant and, uh, I, I have a paper with Nissant and, and G uh, uh, where the question is, for example, you, you know, you, 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 you're told you're sampling an Ising model. So, you know, you're, you're seeing high dimensional samples, but you're told these are coming from an Ising model. And your goal is to understand whether it, for example, is a, it's, a, it's a product measure. Okay, so that's, that's one example. Uh, similar things have been done by, uh, Myself and Chin Chon Pan, but also a paper by uh, Clement, Ilias, and Daniel Kane, I believe, on, on Bayonets. But, but, but generally speaking, I do think it's a very interesting question. 
uh, both uh, in the single sample regime and the multi sample regime to assume something about the high dimensional distribution that you are sampling and, 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 and you know, given that assumption, um, answer whether it satisfies some extra property. So, so very, very interesting and uh, not pretty, pretty fertile as well. So cost is one more question, but the broader perspective, are there other learning problems? Like, you know, let's say taking in the classical pack learning questions or even something like linear regression, Yeah, where you have good sort of non-trivial guarantees and for this one short learning kind of thing. Yeah, so that's a, that's an excellent question. And we do have, um, so going back to this uh, very early example, oops. Uh, here. Uh, so what you're asking is uh, what happens here if, for example, this is a linear model of Xi, that would be the uh, uh, oops. Has my, do you see my second slide or something else? See the back learning slide. It seems to be Yeah, I see data dependency slide. Okay, good. So, so yeah, so uh, if, if I make this into a linear model, mm -hmm. uh, I have the equivalent of the dependent logistic regression problem, mm -hmm. uh, right? Because with beta equals zero, that is logistic regression. So turn this into theta in a product Xi. Mm -hmm. uh, if beta is zero, that is logistic regression. With beta non-zero, uh, dependencies between the y, the network dependencies start coming in so this is the so so uh, so that would be the the the, the classification uh, 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 analog with dependencies you can similarly have a regression problem where uh, again y is theta inner product xi plus some linear function of the other y's or maybe also the other y's and the other theta y x j's mm -hmm. so so these two problems we we have studied ourselves and also have been studied so like especially the linear case uh, is called auto regressive auto regressive model because y depends not just on xi but you know y itself so that, that, that type of recurrence is called auto regressive model mm -hmm. and it, it has been studied so in a in a paper with uh nisanti kala and, and jan spanayas in, in in 2019 we studied this problem where we showed results uh of estimating theta and beta when you know a the interaction network so you know you know who is friends with whom in the school and how strong friends they are but you don't know how strong the peer effect that you're studying is and you also don't know the linear model that connects uh, the features of the students to the behavior so in both linear and uh, 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 classification problems, we have studied that problem. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we studied this case that, uh, that I told you about, but in, in general, this is wide open. So adding different models here or different probability models here uh, is wide open. Uh, in a more kind of like a principled way, let's say like more pack learning style, we also have a paper in Colt last year uh, with, uh, 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 you know, some of the authors of this paper, plus Siddhartha Dayanti, where we prove a uniform convergence and generalization bound, but, but that one is under Dobrushin's condition. So we, we don't, like for the park learning, uh, on the park learning side, we haven't gone beyond Dobrushin. Mm -hmm. For this autoregressive models, which are more specific, linear and logistic, we have gone beyond uh, Dobrushin, although we don't have a clear understanding of all the landscape. Okay. Do you think there's like a general theory, maybe under some conditions on the correlations between the XIs, you can carry over pack learning bounds to the setting? Or would that be yeah. like? Yeah, I, I think there should be. And in fact, uh, if. Um, if you allow yourself more samples, like more independent, multiple independent samples, there is a line of work by London et al. 
that has proven such generalization bounds. Uh, these are not in the extreme regime that I'm talking about, where you have only one sample. Mm -hmm. But if you have, say, uh, various dependent, like many, uh, many uh, independent samples from a high dimensional model, mm -hmm. and you're trying to learn uh, a function that maps all the XIs to all the YIs for this specific, for a specific sample, there are packed results there as well. Okay. I, I hope this made sense. So there is a more developed theory. If you have uh, any independent cells, each of them is uh, a vector of XI vector IIs. So imagine I have one sample for school one, one sample from school two, one sample from school N. So I have, mm -hmm. from each school, I have what all the students in each school do. Mm -hmm. There is a packed learning theory developed by London et al. for that type of setting. The setting I'm considering here is more extreme, where I'm only targeting a specific school, and I want to understand that specific school. So the theory there is less developed, but I think there is a theory. OK. Thanks. Uh, there's one more question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to ask, because uh, for the case where you have uh, L-dependent samples, um, what type of uh, dependencies can you allow? Any, any sort of dependencies? or? So in the paper, we have a result that, uh, um, so we prove a general result that puts some uh, family CalJ on say the spatial dependencies and some family cal j1 on the temporal intertemporal dependencies and we prove a general uh, um, bound that contains the um, entrop like the uh, you know entropic numbers with respect to for both families, for like the sum of the log covering numbers for the two families. So we have we have a general example like that. But this is just a corollary of the broader results. So I think, you know, you can you can consider your own setting and, and you know plug and play and see and see what you get based on the single sample result. Right. So ultimately, whatever structure you assume, uh, it should have a you know decomposable like. Uh, decomposability property that will allow you to you know uh you know uh, reduce the covering number of the big model into maybe a sum of or product of covering numbers of smaller types of sub networks and you know plug it into the uh the uh, the single sample result so it's, it's very, you can do, you know, yeah, we, we have an example in the paper, but we really have not explored that too much. Thanks. So there's one more question from Anna. Do you see any applications to the problem of causal inference under interference? Uh, when, and by interference, I think she means when the treatment in one unit affects the potential outcomes of other units. Oh, yeah. That is a super interesting question. Yeah, I, I'm very interested in that. And uh, sort of like to expand a bit on that. Indeed, when we do experimentation on networks, you know, we, we, you know, we, we, we go and treat some nodes in the network and we want to understand uh, how our treatments affect the behavior. But of course there are peer effects that take our treatments and propagate them throughout the network. So, uh, it is important to be able to disentangle uh, the effects of our treatments, the direct effects or the second order effects that are coming out of uh, uh, propagations. So, so indeed, uh, uh, this is a very interesting problem and uh, you know something that you can uh, use these types of techniques for. Right, and uh, just to be clear, like but just this model here, treating could be going and changing something on that particular node, like XI, right? And then seeing what happened, like this, 
uh, after treating you know five nodes in this network, you get a sample Y of what changed in the network. Did, did people stop drinking alcohol? Uh, but, but you want to disentangle, okay, why did that happen? How important is the impact of your uh, intervention on particular nodes? Are there any other questions? Uh, well, it seems that there aren't any other questions, but uh, Thank you, Costas, and uh, thanks to everybody, all the speakers today. So I guess it's the end of the day uh, for, for Costas midnight now. Uh, and uh, so is Jesse still here? Should I just like end, leave the meeting? How does this end? Like, Yeah, yeah, we'll turn it off or we'll turn off the meeting. Okay, okay, great. Wait, I guess the day resumes tomorrow at nine o'clock. Okay, thank you.